Alrighty, hopefully you intend to be in the business showcase session for Commerce Guys. Um, we have titled it Sell Anything to Anyone Anywhere because they asked for a title before we had content. Um, so we ran with it. Um, and uh, we will be providing more or less an, an update on um, both Drupal Commerce and Platform.sh, the two primary things that Commerce Guys does, um, including you know how it's bringing value to our partners and our you know, direct customers and clients. Um, just a brief bit of background on Commerce Guys. Uh, we are a five-year-old Drupal agency based in Paris, London, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, we formed the company to be experts in Drupal e-commerce. Um, at the time, um, I had just uh, released Ubercart 2 on Drupal 6, and uh, we merged forces with the team from Paris um, to then relaunch our efforts around Drupal Commerce. And um, that's now, you know, continuing to grow and, and do its thing. We're here at the booth to talk about where it's going in the future. Um, and in the meantime, we've also decided to build a hosting platform um, that manages the full development and production lifecycle of um, any, any Drupal project, not just a Drupal Commerce project. But obviously, we built it specifically for our own projects first and have now made it more generally available. So Augustine will talk more about that. Um, we, uh, we didn't feel good talking about ourselves a whole lot in introducing the session, so I'm going to let him introduce me, and then I'll introduce him. We're going to see who can sort of strike the lowest blow. Um, so I introduce you, right? Um, <laughs> so you, uh, I'm lucky because every one of you guys know Ryan already, right? He's been the founder of, uh, one of the founder of Commerce Guys, and he's uh, built on his own, uh, almost on his own uh, Uber card for Drupal 6. Uh, it's your daughter, right, on the, on the picture? Yes. Yeah, right. So <laughs> it's his daughter. He has an incredible family. And now he's, um, he's been the technical uh, lead on uh, Drupal Commerce 1.x, the one that you currently play with. And he's also uh, an, archi an architect, an architect <laughs> of uh, Drupal Commerce 2.x that we're going to introduce you, uh, that he's going to introduce you today. And uh, by saying selling anything to anyone, anywhere, he's selling homish cheese in the U.S. So with Drupal <laughs> Commerce. So that's very true. And otherwise known as Amish, if you don't have a French accent. <laughs> Amish. Um, Augustin is also a merchant and a user of Drupal Commerce. Sorry. Okay. Um, he sells his and her T-shirts using Drupal Commerce, hosted on platform.sh. This is his um, uh, kind of stand-in. It's a, a model, right? And you tell us all that you're married to her. I can't remember. It's how. also my wife. I okay. Can, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Augustin is the uh, the product delivery manager for us at uh, Commerce Guys. So, he's the one directly responsible now, as of like six days ago, um, for making sure that we have platform releases on time and other product releases on time. Um, so, that's who we are. Um, and as an overview of the four topics we'll be covering, uh, it will be a Drupal Commerce 2.x update, um, which is the next version of Drupal Commerce targeting Drupal 8. Um, and then also still a look at where the contributed module ecosystem is today for Drupal Commerce 1 because we aren't all rushing out to build Drupal 8 websites, I imagine. Um, and then Augustin will give us an update on the platform.sh launch that happened this summer um, and the voucher system that now sort of drives our free access system that is also available to anybody else building a software as a service tool that needs that sort of billing and voucher capability. So without further ado, diving into Drupal Commerce. Um, I don't believe he's in here. Boyan? I don't see him. Okay, Boyan Zivanovich um, is the Drupal Commerce 2.x lead developer and my co-maintainer now of the project. And um, we sort of gave him a trial by fire in Paris in June and July where we brought all of our like C partner CTOs and other e-commerce application developers and architects to uh, our offices in Paris to host an architecture sprint um, where we more or less made Boyan defend his ideas for the future. Um, so... We, uh, we had uh, Fabien Potencier from Symphony, uh, or Sincio Labs, and a variety of other folks, including other Symphony-based e-commerce applications, join us to validate the proposed architecture for Drupal Commerce 2, uh, which involves, first of all, moving code out of Drupal into generally available PHP libraries that I'll introduce in a minute. The idea being, now that we have a Drupal 8 core that depends on Symphony and has Composer as a sort of core package management or dependency management solution, we could take advantage of that as well and move code out of our Drupal modules into widely generally available modules to attract perhaps greater consensus from the PHP community to contribute to and use these components. 
So things like address management, pricing, and whatnot that are similar challenges for all e-commerce applications, not just for Drupal users. We're trying to build consensus and bring, bring more people to the table to, I guess, maybe ex expand the influence of our solutions. Um, and so that's what happened in Paris. Um, while we were there, we did first validate um, a, a new proposed, I guess, entity relationship uh, model. Um, so in Commerce 1.x, if you're familiar at all, we have five entity types that we have defined to extend Drupal, including products, line items, orders, customer profiles, and payment transactions. They're all strung together using custom reference fields um, that sort of provide a, a reference implementation of e-commerce out of the box in Drupal 7. Uh, and then, of course, it's up to each um, site developer or maintainer to, um, I guess, add additional functionality to this, this base uh, framework. So uh, what's an example? Shipping, for example, is not covered here. So if you need to track shipments and deliveries and have those matched up against specific line items or specific payments for the purposes of refunds or taxing, like, that's something that you sort of have to add to your Drupal site um, using some contributed module in our ecosystem. Uh, and so we've, we sort of looked at it, um, decided do we need to do more as a core concern? Um, can we do less in some cases? And we arrived at our um, Commerce 2.x entity relationship model, um, which I'll only briefly mention is using entity reference field in core for Drupal 8 now to tie all of our entities together. Um, so we no longer have these sort of one-off use case specific reference fields like we do in Commerce 1.x. And I, I'm not sure, who, who's used Ubercart? Is that maybe familiar to a lot of us? And then who's used Commerce in the room? Okay, so a few more have used Commerce in Ubercart, which is cool, yay. Um, something got better, hopefully. Um, but the, the challenge is when, when you develop a, a, a big project on Drupal like that, as you're developing each new field and each new entity type, there, there are new modules released in the Drupal community that like, improve upon what you've been doing. And so each successive field that you write and each successive entity type that you define gets a little bit more complete, but you still have all this old code that you have to carry around with you like a, a weight tied to your foot. And so um, each of our reference fields, for example, in Commerce 1.x are implemented differently um, until we finally arrived at the entity reference field, but by that time we already had Commerce 1.x released, um, so we didn't have that to take advantage of. But in Commerce 2.x, We'll be able to get rid of about 3,000 lines of inconsistent code um, and just use the core entity reference field module instead, which is a huge win for us. Um, additionally, we, we are maybe mapping out um, more um, entity types than we've had before, uh, but, but part of that is because we, um, uh, it's, it's, it's just easier. Like the entity API in Drupal 8 is more robust and more complete than what we have in Drupal 7. Um, but we also realize that there are more things that are inherent to e-commerce than we um, provided for or allowed for in Commerce 1.x. So, so one example is in the bottom right hand here. You can see that we've separated out a payment transaction from a payment allocation. And a lot of people will think, well, that's stupid. That's just needless, you know, uh, abstraction. Um, but the, the real challenge comes in whenever you have a payment and you need to refund part of that payment um, because, you know, some of it went toward this, um, this line item, some of it went toward shipping, and this much was taxed. Well, I need to know whenever I come to process a refund, is the part that I'm refunding, was that taxed or was that just some digital product that wasn't taxed? There's a lot of things there that, that's separating out, like the actual payment transaction with the gateway from how it was allocated on an order will make a significant difference to. Um, other things include no longer separating out products from product displays, which is one of the, the sort of key steps or differences that we made in coming to commerce from Ubercart was the idea that all of your product SKUs are defined independently and sort of exist in their own table and then they're referenced by other pieces of content on the website to create what we call a product display, um, which looks like an add to cart form that may or may not have options that you're selecting. And we had a lot of good reasons for separating things out, but we've realized that a lot of those good reasons have sort of evaporated now with um, innovations in Drupal 8 itself. So we'll go back to products themselves being displayable entities that may or may not have children that determine um, things like the size of a t-shirt that you're selecting from a group. Um, but that, that's two of, the, two of the biggest changes that we'll have um, in the entity relationship model around products and also around payment. Some other things will be coming down the pipe, like having an actual store entity where you define your store global level configuration or to facilitate marketplaces and that kind of thing. Um, so those are things that are going to change in the entity relationship model. We'll tease those out over time. But honestly, we, we really dove into um, Commerce 2.x development by focusing on the libraries first and on some of that consensus building first. Um, so the first one that we put up was the Commerce Guys slash INTL library. 
um, which is just an internationalization library that's focusing on um, currency formatting and management and also locale management. Um, so the idea here is that, and you may have seen Boyan's blog post on the topic, it's linked here, it'll be linked in the slides. Um, but the idea is that the euro doesn't have a, like a, a format. Um, you know, who, who here has like background in trying to just do like multi, you know, international like e-commerce in Europe? A few of us. It, did you actually use one format for the euro? Did you make it dependent on the country? So in the UK, the sign might come before and in France, it'll come after. And in some places, it's going to have a, a comma versus a period and so on. Even though it's one currency, it actually has a wide variety of ways for it to be displayed to the end user. Um, and so this library actually accommodates all of that um, for basically every currency known to mankind, um, except for the ones that are no longer used. We have tried to cull out some of the craft from the, the database. Um, but what's great about this library is that because Boyan started here and did such a stellar job producing it, um, it is now influencing the direction of Symphony itself. Um, so Symphony 2.6 is going to have um, our JSON source files or data files here and use some of the concepts that we have implemented for locale and currency selection. Um, and then Symphony 2.7 should actually have this code in it, so we no longer even have to have this as a dependency. So that's obviously not set in stone, and if Fabian were here, he might take issue. But the, the idea is that, that Symphony is generally moving in the direction of the implementation we have here for currency and number formatting, which would be a huge win for us, obviously one less thing for us to depend on and manage and maintain. Um, once you have currency formatting and currency handling, the next thing you have to care about is how to actually build and manipulate a price. Um, because, of course, if you're talking about European usage versus the U.S., you have different types of taxes in sales tax versus VAT. Um, but even with VAT rules, you have different uh, you know, orders in which they might apply relative to certain types of discounts. Obviously, if you're doing business to business and a mix of B2C, then you have different ways that you have to apply your, your VAT and manage those prices. Um, so this library is all about instantiating a price object actually having an API to manipulate the price and then tracking the changes you know, as necessary relative to one another. So that's um, probably the least developed of the three. The next one being the, uh, the second most developed is the addressing library. Um, and Boyan recently blogged about this as well if you're interested. Um, as with currencies, um, you have locale specific address formatting and address requirements. Obviously for different countries you have the selection of provinces and states and regions and the like. And what we did in this library is we're still using the, um, the XAL, the Extensible Address Language um, uh, XML schema that we adopted for the address field module in Commerce One. Um, but here we've actually taken Google's data set from the Android SDK to get all of the address formats for every country in the world, and including their locale-specific address formats. And so one example is just that if you have a Chinese e-commerce um, site, if you're viewing this site in Chinese, the order of the address elements is reversed from if you were viewing this site in English, even if the, um, the destination address were a Chinese address. Uh, so there, there are real funny requirements like that that Google took who knows how much time to condense into one giant data set um, that they've let us relicense under an MIT license and package up in the JSON files that we can then use both to build address forms and to format addresses for display. Uh, and we also differentiate between formatting an address for display on the screen versus on a printed label, um, for example, in the United States, so that the postal services machines can read the addresses for automatic sorting. You have to have everything in all capital, you know, all capital letters, whereas on, this, on the, uh, the website you wouldn't do that. So a lot of things accommodated by the addressing library. It feels like we finally have like, an actual answer to the mess of our own creation um, in the address field uh, module that you might currently be using. And all this sort of leads up to the point that we're doing something right, um, because it's attracted attention not just within the Drupal community, but even beyond our borders. So we, we've often talked about getting off the island in the Drupal community by taking advantage of third-party libraries and not maintaining everything in-house. But we're now actually exporting as well. So we're not just importing new tools. We're able to push our, you know, push our solutions upstream and get folks you know, following along um, you know, to put us in a nice, hot, trending spot for one day, anyways. Um, because they, they like the solution and they're, they're looking to use them in their own e-commerce applications, even outside of Drupal. Um, so if you want to learn more about where 2.x is headed or what's already been developed, um, Boyan Zivanovich will be leading a BOF. He's our 2.x lead developer. Um, that will be tomorrow in the Emerald Lounge at 10.45 a.m. Um, so that's Drupal Commerce 2 in a nutshell. 
Yeah, and that's very cool, Ryan. Thanks very yeah. much. <laughs> but uh, that's also for the future, right? That's uh, Commerce to the coming. But there are already lots of uh, very interesting stuff on uh, Commerce uh, One Dex, the Drupal Commerce. And can you tell more about that? Yes, I will, Augustin. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that prompt. <laughs> we rehearsed that. Asha? No, we didn't. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, so Commerce One.x is also still getting attention, obviously. Um, we're nearing 50,000 sites, uh, which means in probably just a few weeks, uh, we will have more Drupal Commerce sites than there are Ubercart sites. Woo -hoo. Um, you know, uh, so that's, that's kind of, uh, I, I don't know, who here played Mario Kart a lot on the Super Nintendo? Is that, you know how you could always, you could race against your ghost? I kind of feel like I've been, I've been chasing that Ubercart number ever since we released Commerce, and we're almost there. Um, but th that represents like a huge um, traction, more more than I ever expected. And uh, you know what we're finding is that uh, you know every week somebody is releasing a new module to integrate a new payment system. We're doing several. You might find them in our marketplace. A new fulfillment system, um, a new niche concern for Chinese e-commerce versus Russian e-commerce versus what you know whatever. I think whenever Bitcoin became big, there were suddenly like six different Bitcoin payment modules available. Um, so we, we've sort of reached the tipping point where people use commerce as their sort of de facto um, solution for e-commerce on Drupal 7. Uh, and we continue to integrate new service providers and try to, uh, you know, flesh out the, the weak systems where need be. Um, but there's, there's still more to do. Um, I think the, the, most, the most pressing changes revolve around digital e-commerce in the EU. Um, you're going to have changes to how you have to charge tax. Uh, I, I believe it's, it's country of destination taxing for digital products versus source country, and I'm not sure how it all works out. Uh, but the idea is that um, these modules will continue to provide full EU VAT support, even with the upcoming changes. Um, and these are, these are maintained by David Kitchen out of our office in the UK. Um, and then we also have a couple of tax services integrated, Exactor and Avalara. And I'm not sure if Avalara manages VAT in the EU, but I know Exactor does. Um, so we continue to, to focus on, you know, making sure that you can sell anything to anyone anywhere, including every country in the EU, through both VAT support and multi-currency support. Um, but what has me most excited, and I call it my vertical to watch, is digital commerce. And I, was anybody here at uh, DrupalCon Austin? A few? Did you catch the digital commerce ecosystem presentation? By any chance? No? Um, Boyan and David Kitchen were there. Um, and they, you know, it's, it's recorded here for you to go and view. Uh, but it basically walks through the entire suite of modules that we've developed um, to power the, uh, the billing and subscription management behind platform and behind our marketplace. Um, so what you have in the whole digital commerce ecosystem now for Drupal um, is the, the full capability to license digital assets, whether that's membership on a website or um, d uh, access to a file or ownership of a platform. Um, you can then tie that to some sort of card on file payment method obviously managed through a payment gateway. Um, and then you have licensed billing, which supports um, both metered usage and um, just uh, monthly, monthly billing or recurring billing. Uh, and you then have Dunning management modules to close the loop on making sure that expired credit cards get notified and people continue to pay their bills on time. Um, so that whole suite of modules exists. And I, I feel like there was something I'm missing in there as well. Mm -hmm. Slips my mind. Invoicing. What's that? Invo yeah, invoicing. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember. Not important. Um, but, but the big idea is that, that I see right now, um, Drupal Commerce actually provides one of the most re, uh, robust digital commerce um, offerings on the market. Um, I, I know that, that some of the, the big names are Digital River and other, other big digital commerce specific applications. Um, but, but in what we have here, both with Drupal as the sort of base, both to build communities and to manage, you know, uh, manage private files and divvy out access based on any number of parameters. We have sort of the foundation that we need to then just add commerce to it to really create any kind of digital commerce um, site imaginable. And um, so we're, we're, some of our, our biggest client successes lately have been from um, whether, you know, ticketing or subscription management or, um, you know, digital streaming uh, vi video services or whatever. Anyways, I, I see this as a vertical to watch and it's something that I'm most interested in selling today is finding more digital commerce opportunities for us to take on and continue to test and build out the ecosystem of modules around it. Um, so what's next for us is a virtual sprint after DrupalCon Amsterdam, um, where we'll focus on 
uh, Drupal Commerce 1.11 release. Some of us may have seen the security release recently um, for Commerce 1.10. Uh, there's more that we hoped to do before we had to put that release out, but we also wanted to get the username bug fixed. Um, so we'll do that sprint after Amsterdam. If anybody would like to join us virtually, um, there is a thread on DrupalCommerce.org that I can't remember the title of that's sort of organizing this whole thing. Um, we're also looking to make significant merchant usability improvements. Um, so in partnership with ICOS, we've developed a new backend um, that's much more rational for a non-technical merchant um, to manage returns and do customer service on orders. Um, and I, I, I kind of think last report I got indicated that might have been a bit tightly coupled to their requirements. So we may have to do some abstraction before that's totally... Um, uh, publishable up on Drupal.org, but I expect that to happen soon. And then finally, I, I'm also personally committed to uh, refocusing our efforts on marketing and reporting tools. Um, once upon a time, we integrated with Giraffe um, that provided a full e-commerce analytics dashboard out of the box in the back end of your commerce site. Uh, then once upon a time, they stopped supporting Drupal Commerce. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was a refocusing on their part on other e-commerce platforms at the same time that they rebuilt their API. So suddenly we were left without anything except a views-powered reporting dashboard. So I'm uh, you know, in talks with Keen.io, which is kind of my favorite service at the moment um, for taking reporting out of the Drupal database and then still having nice fancy visualizations and widgets for the, the store merchant and marketer to, to use to track the, pro you know, the, the success of their store. So um, looking for those things to happen probably over the next six months although the, the usability um, improvements to the back end should land sooner. If you have any questions about this, feel free to find me afterwards, um, and I'd love to get you plugged in to help making these things uh, more robust. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Augustan to talk about the exciting developments in Platform.sh. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. And I'll take your mic so I can heckle you. Oh, you can do the reverse, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, guys. Sorry for my uh, accent. I'm French, so um, I need to still work on that. Could you repeat um, that? I couldn't understand. Uh, okay, so, um, I'll try to, to, to do it better. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> and we did reverse that. Um, so, uh, any of you guys have heard about Platform SH? Okay, oh, that's wow. a small amount. We have work uh, to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of work, so uh, we're, <laughs> we're switched the session now. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, to just summarize what's Platform. Uh, Platform is the new development and hosting solution that we've built at Commerce Guys. We've been uh, building that for our first own use case, and then we have decided to market that as a product and deliver that for anyone to uh, build um, Drupal projects and now all sort of PHP projects. It's not only specific to Drupal. You can build any Symfony application, any WordPress application, any PHP, custom PHP. Basically, the, the whole idea is that each, each Git branch gets its own URL. So each time you create a branch, Platform will deploy a complete new environment for you where you can te test your feature that you're implementing on that branch and have a complete like, live environment which uh, will implement that feature. So that's the main idea. I really encourage you to go to our booth, our booth to get uh, a demo and just, uh, just um, like see how, how it works. Because I'm not going to just uh, go very deep into the details of Platform. I'm going to talk about uh, one website that we launched on Platform Enterprise. Um, which is flixbus.de, which has been implemented by Wundercrowd, which is our platform partner. So they have decided to move all of their uh, development into Platform SH for all of their projects. So we're very proud of that. And uh, we, uh, they have recently launched the flixbus.de, which is uh, a very uh, big website for ticketing systems. So one of the 10 most uh, ticketing systems in Europe. They sell like long distance uh, buses. And uh, why does it matter? Why, why, why are we talking now about that project? Because this, this is really a big project. Uh, this is, uh, their, their website is where they make business. That's where they sell their products. Uh, the website just can never go down, right? Uh, they, they have to have a very, very high availability. And how do we fix that? Why, di how, how, why did they choose platform for that? Why, why is it so important for them to have platform? That's because our architecture in platform uh, implements a triple redundancy redundancy architecture, sorry. So we have three, each, uh, each environment has, is deployed into three different data centers, okay? We are using uh, Amazon uh, AWS to deploy your website, and each of the project is hosted in three different instances. So we, 
we can just kill one host and uh, like take down one host or two hosts and your website will still be running. Okay, that's very important for them. And what's even more important is that their website has lots of fluctuations over the year, right? If it's uh, during vacation times, they are going to have lots and lots of um, of cells, and then they want to be able to scale very easily without any downtime. They don't, they cannot have any downtime. And what we do is with platform, we can have um, zero downtime scalability also horizontally, but also more importantly, vertically. So we can just make a host grow over time without any downtime by just taking down one host, rebooting it later, and the other hosts are going to take care of the, the, the traffic of the website. And we also provide um, like since security is really important for e-commerce, any e-commerce website, we provide 100% uh, SSL uh, security, and we we use CloudFront for the CDN. So we use CloudFront to to really do the caching of all the assets that are served on the website. And the main thing of a platform is that it really helps to keep things organized, because platforms allows you to have a lot of different development environments. Each branch is an environment, so that you can work with as many environments as you want uh, in the workflow that you want. So if you look at the platform UI, it allows you to have lots of environments, and you can give each of the environments to one specific developer, or you can give it to a client to test on that. You can give it to uh, a specific front-end integrator and just um, start an environment directly for him where he can just test his stuff and then you merge back to the live environment and you do you manage all your deployment directly into the platform SH interface. So that's really uh, that's really uh, something powerful that uh, all the other providers don't don't provide like all those environments where you can just test your stuff uh, in the live conditions. Yeah, and the, the idea there is that an environment then just sort of becomes a cheap resource. It's it's meant to be spun up, used and then once it's served its purpose, you know, thrown away. Um, so on a, on a project that I have um, in, uh, in Greenville, it's just me and another developer. Um, obviously, we want to continue to develop you know, in, in parallel to one another. Um, so we have our master environment that then had a sprint-specific environment beneath it. And because it maintains the hierarchy um, for the purposes of synchronizing commits up and data down, um, we then beneath the sprint uh, environment have one each development environment for myself and the other individual I'm working with. Uh, and then we're able to synchronize things in our you know, sprint branch and then merge everything back up to master. And then at the end of the sprint, just delete those environments and start afresh. And then what's, what's great about having access-controlled environments is that if we needed to use somebody else, so let's say we, we had to, to outsource part of the development to um, some consultant or freelancer, um, we could create an environment that was the only environment that user could access in our platform. Um, so they couldn't then control the deployment of new features or you know, mess up anything else that we have going on at all. Um, so I've, we found that to be particularly useful as an end user of the project. So. Exactly, specifically, specifically for a big project where you have lots of people working on the project and not all of them are working at the same time. So you just want to be able to create create environment really easily and destroy the environment once the user has been uh, done working on that feature. Uh, and if you have really, if you have any question about platform, please come at our booth. We'll have lots of sessions, lots of uh, demonstration about the platform. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. But why are we uh, again talking about platform and why did Ryan mention the, the digital uh, commerce stuff? That's because acquiring customers when you're doing recurring business like selling platform subscription or selling trainings or selling events, uh, that's really hard. Like recurring subscriptions, uh, acquiring customers for recurring subscription is really hard. And you have a couple of models to fix that. One of them is the freemium. Okay, you can give part of your project, like part of your product for free to your customers. But since um, each of the new environments on the platform case, for example, each of the environments cost money, we, we cannot really afford that. We're going to lose a lot of money uh, just by doing freemium because we cannot just reduce the, 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 the product to something that we can give for free, right? So we've decided to implement the vouchers, what we call vouchers, which is um, a, a time-based subscription for free that people can use your product and that people can just say whether they want, they like it or not. And then after a while, you are going to start paying for that. And that's actually, uh, uh, that's been like, Propose to DrupalCommerce.org so you can find the voucher module into DrupalCommerce.org and implement that on your uh, on your own website if you're doing any recurring re recurring business and that's very effective. I mean, Google AdWorks, for example, has been using that and they were giving like one hundred one hundred dollar for free to any new subscription for their product and that we are now all using their product. So that's very effective and that's also allows the allow your sales team to do their own job, right? They can create 
vouchers on your on your on your website. They can give that give that to your customers, and they can track the revenue of your uh, like any campaign that they want to create. They can just track what's been happening, when it's been happening. They can uh, improve the voucher. They can really play with your product. So I'm not there. Yeah, that's that's very important, and that's really been built by commerce guys. Uh, and deployed on Drupal Commerce, so feel free to use it and feel free to uh, report it. And yeah, we have lots of vouchers for platform and we're going to give that to you. So just come at the end of the session and ask me for a voucher and I'll give you a voucher for trying platform. And I think I'm good and I give the mic to Ryan. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's most of what's going on in Commerce guys these days. Um, if there are any questions, we can entertain them for a few minutes. Otherwise, if you'd like to know more, you can come join us at the booth or at the Commerce Village, um, where you can find a variety of our technical partners um, there to talk about uh, their payment and email and uh, fulfillment solutions. So I had one in the corner. Yeah, the, the question is, 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 or is platform.sh specifically tooled up for commerce? Yeah. Or is it, you know, why, generally... Why is it better for commerce? Yeah, yeah, it's, no, it's not. I mean, yeah, it's not specific to commerce. Uh, maybe the only, the only differentiating thing would be that you get an SSL certificate for free on any level of platform subscription. Um, I think uh, last I checked, it was like um, SSL started at $100 a month on Pantheon. I'm not sure what it is on Acquia. But I mean, that's, that's kind of a minor thing. The, the underlying um, architecture is much like what you would use for any Drupal website. So the full stack of, you know, Nginx, PHP 5.3, maybe 4, PHP 5. something, MySQL, Redis, Solar, et cetera. It's all pretty, pretty similar, um, you know, grid of services. So. Yeah, basically platform is not specific to Drupal Commerce, but it's more, in a sense, specific to Drupal because we are leveraging all the best practices that we have in Drupal. For example, you can just push a Mac file and platform will build your project for you without needing to just pull all the Drupal f push all the Drupal files. So basically, uh, it, that's really easy to maintain your modules because you can just edit your Mac file and repush something, and your deployments, are, your environments are going to get deployed with those new versions. So you get your repository very clean. And since we support also Symfony applications, we do that exactly the same way with uh, Composer JSON files. Yeah, another one on the wall. Yeah, so the, the question is how long does it take to build an environment once you've created the branch? So the, the, the current response is a, a bit less than 30 seconds. Um, and we are still not happy about that because 30 seconds makes the difference between something that is instant or something that is like very short. And we want the instant version. It's, so it's we are long still enough improving. for me to start a chess yeah. match. It's I mean, a, yeah, 30 seconds, like you can, if you're waiting 30 seconds for your new environment, uh, to build, you can just uh, switch page and go to facebook.com or something like that. So we, we really want to improve that uh, and make sure it's going to be instance. So instance pretty provisioned? No, they are not there. We are we are doing like a snapshot of all the containers running at the at the like at the the, the instance level. So we're not doing an export of the database. We don't have any downtime on the on the website. We are really doing a snapshot and using that snapshot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that doesn't really depend on the size of the website because it's like, it's really a snapshot. So, so yeah, a bit less than thirty seconds for now. Yeah. Yep. So that's a good question. We are going like deep into the the platform. <laughs> Uh, the question is about uh, synchronizing databases, and yeah, directly the, uh, directly from the platform SHUI, you can get uh, you have a hierarchy between the environments. So when you create an environment, uh, the environment knows about its parents. So if you create if you clone uh, the live environment, you create a child of the, the the live environment, and you can synchronize the database from the live environment into the parent the child environment, and then again that child environment you can branch it again and synchronize the database. And once you do the synchronization of the database, you can also run uh, sanitization scripts using Drush. And those uh, configurations are uh, included into your Git repository, which means that directly from the UI when you 
branch and environment or you, uh, you synchronize a database, you can run sanitization. So all your development environments will not, we, will not get any live data like uh, user passwords or user emails or... Okay, the CLI, the command line interface that we've provided, which is available on uh, github.com, uh, is an extension of the platform. Platform provides an API, and the UI that uh, you saw on the screenshot uh, uses that API, but the CLI also uses that API. So everything that is available on the UI will be available on, CLI, on CLI. And the CLI offers, like, like yeah, helps you to, to, to kickstart your project. Like, you can branch, you can synchronize, you can destroy environments. But that's not an extension to Drush. You still need, you still use Drush the same way that you were using uh, Drush before. So that's a good question. For now, uh, platform SH, we don't uh, provide a way of just doing your local environment because we, we think that the best practice is really to have as many development environments live on platform, but you can still use the CLI to build your website locally. That means that if you run the, the platform build command from the CLI, it's going to build your files on your uh, local server and it, they are going to get deployed the same way as they would if they were on a platform, except that you can, like, you can use Drush to uh, like synchronize your database and get uh, the, the if you need solar for example you need to set up the, set that up yourself and so do you that sure yeah and platform provides you the aliases automatically so you just when you get a branch you also get the aliases directly so that's handy uh, really I encourage you to go to our booth and uh, learn more about platform Augustine does good demos <laughs> <laughs> any other questions about uh, what's going on with Commerce guys or Drupal Commerce, yeah. Is it possible to host it on what? Yeah, yeah. The question is: Is it possible to host it only in European data centers? And the answer is yes. We uh, actually started. We're not using Ireland for we have both US and, uh, and uh, Europe. When yeah. Third Which is yes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, not an, yeah, right. right. <laughs> so yes, um, yeah, but yeah, using two different um, Amazon data centers, one in the U.S. and one in the EU. So and the roadmap uh, for platform is to not only uh, be able to be to get deployed on AWS. So we also want to be able to give you platform and that you can deploy on your own data center. Or a Raspberry Pi. Or Raspberry Pi, if you have a powerful <laughs> Raspberry Pi, right? I know you do, right? All right, we'll, we'll tie it off there. If you have any further questions about platform, feel free to come harass Augustin. And if you have any about Drupal Commerce, feel free to harass me. And uh, we'll see you the rest of the con. Thank you very much, guys. And yeah, come to me to get a voucher if you want to try a platform. <laughs>